God himself is with us. Let us all adore him, and with all happy before him. God is here within us, souls in silence fear him, humbly fervently draw near him. Now he you to bow your heads as we pray. Dear Father in heaven, in your name, the description of both your infiniteness and your intimacy to us. And then on this first Sabbath of 2023, we are grateful to be in your presence, to sing praises to you, and to prepare our hearts to listen to your word. I pray that your Holy Spirit will be present, will be active, and will be felt by each one of us here today. Amen. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Bow down before Him, His glory proclaim. Obedience and incense of lowliness. Kneel and adore Him, the Lord is here. Name. Low at his feet lay thy burden of carefulness. High on his heart he will bear it for thee. Comfort thy sorrows and answer thy prayerfulness. Guiding thy steps as may best for thee be. Fear not to enter his courts in the slenderness. Of the poor world thou wouldst reckon as thine. Truth in its beauty and love in its tenderness. These are the offerings to lay at his shrine. These all we bring them in trembling and fearfulness. He will accept for the name that is dear. Mornings of joy give for evenings of cheerfulness. Trust for our trembling and hope for our fear. I'd like to welcome each one of you here today as we gather to worship the Lord. I want this opportunity to wish you all a happy new year. And may this truly be a very special year where we draw closer to the Lord and that we may give those gifts he's given to us to build up his church 
and to build up his kingdom. I'd like to invite each one of those who are able to kneel with me as we seek the Lord in prayer. Our loving Heavenly Father, our Lord, Lord of Lords and King of Kings, the one seated on the throne, O oh Lord, we lift up our hearts in gratefulness today, Lord, for your goodness and love that you just loved us. What is man that you're mindful of him and the son of man that you care so much for us, that you sent your one and only son to die for us, to take our place on that rugged cross, Lord, and that one day that we may come into your presence and together with the angels, we can worship you and sing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Oh, Lord, I pray that you will come into our presence, that you will bless us, bless us with the preaching of your word, Father. May we be drawn closer to you. Bless us as we give our all to you, Father. Um, I just pray for those who are really struggling right now, those who have lost loved ones, and their heart is so bent down in grief, Father. May your spirit be with them in such a special way to lift them up and draw them closer to you. Just give them the strength they need each and every day. I pray for those who are really struggling financially, Lord, and there's so many. Oh, Lord, I just pray as you'll touch our hearts that we can give and help those in need and that you'll bless them, Father, that you are the one who supplies all our needs and we acknowledge that today. Please bless us and guide us. Bless your church, Father, as we preach that gospel, Father. And may we be ready as your people when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven. We give ourselves to you, Lord, now. Please bless us with your presence. Lead us and guide us. Draw us closer to you. Help us to understand more of your amazing love for each one of us. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Right. Is that better? Okay, good. How are you guys doing? Good. good. Have you had a good new year so far? The whole week of a new year. Yeah. Awesome. So I'm sure there's lots of things you guys want to do this year. You Are you in school? Uh, yes. Grade what? Uh, grade all the Okay, awesome. So you're going to learn lots of stuff. You're going to be busy doing things. But I want to tell you a story about what's most important, doing or being. Okay. Now, who knows what a civil war is? It's, it's a weird name, hey, because civil means to be nice and kind to people, and war means the opposite. But a civil war is when people in the same country fight against each other. 
And about 160 years ago in America, they were fighting against each other. And there was a soldier who had a big problem. You see, he, it was only him and his brother. His dad was quite old, lived on a farm with his mom and his sister. And he and his brother went off to fight in the war. And his brother was killed in the war. And to make things worse, soon after his brother was killed, he got a letter from home saying that his dad had died as well. And he knew the time was coming to plant all the things on the farm. And he knew his mom and sister couldn't do it by themselves. And he knew that unless they planted, they would starve. They needed to plant crops to, to survive. But what can I do? I know I will go and speak to the president of the country. I will travel to Washington, and the president lives in America, lives in a building called the White House. I'll go to the White House, and I'll ask the president if he can please excuse me from fighting duties so I can just go back in time to help plant. So he made his way to the White House, and when he got to the front entrance, there was a soldier standing, there and he said, sorry, the president is a very, very busy man. I can't let you go inside and see him. You, don't, you need to make an appointment, and you have to be really important. And the soldier thought, oh, no, what am I going to do? So he went and he sat on a bench across the street with his head in his hands. He was really wondering. He was desperate. What can I do? And suddenly he heard a voice saying, hey, mister, what's wrong? And he looked up and there was a, an eight-year-old boy standing. And the soldier felt so bad and he told the little boy why he was so upset. And the little boy said, I can help you. And the soldier said, well, <laughs> I don't really think so. The boy said, no, come with me. So the soldier thought, well, I'm desperate. I may as well try. So the little boy grabbed his hand and led him back across the street to the White House, up the steps, through the door. This time the guard didn't say anything. He just let them go past. And the soldier thought, that's really weird. And they went up the stairs, down the passage, past lots of important people. No one said anything. They just let them walk in. They got to a big office door, and the little boy didn't even knock. He just opened the door and walked right up to the desk where the president was sitting. And the president looked up at him and said, Hello, Tad, who's your friend? And the little boy, Tad, said, This is my friend. I met him outside, and he has something that he needs to ask you. And the soldier asked the president, told him his story, and the president gave him time off from the army to go home and help his mom and sister. When the soldier first saw the little boy, he thought he was just a little boy. But who was he? He was the president's son. And that's what I want you to remember. Sometimes you might think, I'm just a kid. I can't do big things. But whose child are we all? God. We are child, children of God. That's absolutely right. You've learned the most important thing. You don't need to go to school anymore. <laughs> we are children of God. And that's the first thing we need to remember going into this new year. It's much more important than what we do is who we are. Because who we are influences what we, what we do. And because we are children of God, we have all of God's power, all of God's love, all of God's kindness available to us. And he wants us to do just what Tad does, what Tad did in the story. And that's go and share who we are and especially share who our Father is with everyone we meet. Can we do that? Let's pray. Dear Father, thank you that you love us and that you've chosen each one of us as your children. And as these four precious kids start this year, help them never to forget that you are their Father in heaven. And in you... They have all the love, kindness, and power they'll ever need. Amen. Cool. Thanks, guys. Are you going to be able to help with a little hands offering? Great. Thank you. Sorry, Andrew. We're going to have uh, the QR code on the screen um, for you to return your tithes and offerings if you are still giving in an analog manner with hard cash, then our deacons will come now and collect your offerings. And after the QR code has been on the screen for another 20 or 30 seconds, we are also starting a stewardship education program at Helderberg Church. 
So um, we're going to be playing a short video clip every week for the next 10 weeks during this worship by giving time, um, just to expand our understanding of what stewardship is. Thank you. It's mine. No, it's mine. But you know it's mine. But Daddy bought it for me. I often tell my children when they're arguing over a toy, I was there when you came into this world. I saw you and you came with nothing. See, everything you have, we provided for you, even this toy. So share it. And that, of course, is true for all of us. God is the creator and owner of everything. We came into this world with nothing and we will exit this world with nothing. See, everything we have, God has provided. Let's remember that these are His blessings to share. Remember, stewardship is my all in response to God's all. Let's bow our heads together. Our loving Heavenly Father, thank you that you have given, given all to us, Father, when you gave us your Son, Father. And thank you so much that this little part that we can do by just giving just a little back to you, Father. And we can have that part in just building up your kingdom. Our oh, Lord, I pray your blessings on, it, on, on these offerings today, Lord. May they be used for the honor and glory of your name and to build up your kingdom. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Today I will share with you a very familiar hymn, but I think it's very appropriate as we come into the service and as we prepare ourselves to receive the message that God has in mind for us. shall unclasp and set me free. Silently now I wait for thee, ready, my God, thy will to see. Open my eyes, illumine me, Spirit divine. Open my ears that I may hear Voices of truth thou sendest clear And while the wave floods fall on my ear Everything false will dis. 
Silent be now, I wait for thee. Ready, my God, thy will to hear. Open my ears, illumine me. Spirit divine, open my mouth and let me bear gladly the warm truth everywhere. Open my heart and let me prepare love with thy children thus to share. Silently now I wait for thee, ready, my God, thy will to share. Open my heart, illumine me, Spirit Divine. Gideon stands with his hand on the hilt of his sword. It's slippery because his palms are clammy and he can't stop them sweating. He watches as the very last ranks of almost his entire army disappear over the distant hill. He knows he has to turn and face his men standing next to the river. That every second that he delays increases the doubt and fear that must be building in their hearts. And so eventually, forcing down the nausea rising from the hollow feeling in his stomach, swallowing hard, Gideon slowly pivots and looks at his 300 men standing at the bank of the river. He can only hold their gaze for a second, and so looks up at the hill of Mora behind them, it looks peaceful and quiet, but he knows that just over that hill in the valley beyond are camped 135,000 savage warriors with one aim, to destroy him, to destroy his family, to destroy his tribe, to destroy his nation. And here before him are the 300 soldiers that God has left to do the job. Who do I think I am, he says. I mean, this was a suicide mission to start with. I can't even call myself an army commander anymore. I'm more like a, a gang leader with this number of soldiers left. Fear threatens to overwhelm him. Who do I think I am? He brings his gaze back to the men standing, looking expectantly at him for leadership and he drops to his knees. That's the trailer for the story we're gonna be spending some time in today, this very first Sabbath of 2023. It's a brand new year, and the first week is ending, as Fonny said, just like the very first week in the newly created world ended with a Sabbath. And like Gideon, we also stand, looking back over 2022, the dust still hanging in the air, and the hill of 2023 rising before us. At this time of year, we start thinking about all the things we want to do better, to be better. And maybe, like Gideon, we have an identity crisis. You this year. Well, 2023, right, and finally the new you appears, or will you meet up again with the old you, with all your failings and faults that you're so familiar with? 
So, God has blessed me with a truth, a new perspective at the beginning of this year. And I'd like to share it with you. And I hope that you will also experience the difference that it can make so that your 2023 can be different too. Because the truth is that for our, our activity to be meaningful, our identity has to be factual. For our activity to matter from 2023 into eternity, our identity must be grounded in reality. Because what you think about when you think about yourself is one of the most important things about you. The identity you take on for yourself dictates your thoughts, your decisions, and ultimately your behavior. We often think it's the other way around, that our activity drives our identity. We are what we do. And so we make New Year's resolutions about all the things that we want to do, a checklist. But in reality, our identity drives our activity. So you saw the trailer. Now let's get into the story, because through this story, God explains perfectly what I'm trying to convey to you, what I'm trying to say. We're going to go to the book of Judges, which covers the period of history of the nation of Israel from about 1,200 years before Jesus is born. Just after the second leader to have led them out of slavery in Egypt, Joshua has died. The nation of Israel is occupying the land of Canaan that God gave them as the promised land. But the vision that God had for his people was that this would be the land where after generations of slavery, they would find their true identity and they would reveal to the nations around them what God was like, what his identity is. But instead of embracing this identity, they fall into idol worship and do not follow the plan God has for them. They have no leader, and the Bible says that each person does what is right in his own eyes. This leads to them being under constant attack from the surrounding nations. And when we pick up the story in Judges chapter 6, they're in the seventh consecutive year of being raided by the Midianites, the Amalekites, and other nations from the east. The Bible describes these raids as locusts descending, stripping the land bare, and then retreating again, leaving the Israelites on the brink of starvation. And before we get into the actual text, let's bow our heads for a moment since we pray. Father, your words are in my heart. May they be on my lips and in the ears and hearts of us all. Amen. And so in Judges, the sixth chapter from verse 11, we read, Gideon, son of Joash, was threshing wheat at the bottom of a winepress to hide the grain from the Midianites. Now, I don't know how many of you have, may have threshed wheat manually yourselves, but the ideal the handful of husks against the ground or against the object. Gideon is using a wine press, a small depression in rock used for crushing grapes to get the juice out. Definitely not an ideal place to thresh grain, but a good hiding place when you're scared of the surrounding attacking nations. And so while he's busy in this task, he's startled by an unexpected visitor. The angel of the Lord appears to him and says, mighty hero, the Lord is with you. I'm sure Gideon glances behind him quickly just to make sure that the angel is talking to him and then answers, sir, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? And where are all the miracles our ancestors told us about? Didn't they say the Lord brought us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and handed us over to the Midianites. Isn't this just typical of human nature? I know I do it. 
When everything's going well, it's because we are doing well, right? And as soon as things go wrong, God has abandoned us. This is the identity that Gideon is taking on. The angel replies to him and says, Go with the strength you have and rescue Israel from the Midianites. I am sending you. But Lord Gideon replied, How can I rescue Israel? My clan is the weakest in the whole of the tribe of Manasseh, and I am the least in my entire family. I mean, that's why I'm here threshing the wheat in this ridiculous place. I drew the short straw. I'm the least. But Gideon misses a key word in the previous verse in verse 14. I am sending you. This is the word that God used when he tried to convince another reluctant hero, Moses, standing at the burning bush, and he says, who shall I say is sending me? And God says, I am who I am. My identity is enough to fulfill my promises. I am sending you. It's not about your strength, Gideon. It's not about your identity, wherever you think your place is in the family and in your tribe. It's about who I am and who you are in me. The great I am has a plan of action for Gideon to save his people, but Gideon has tragically forgotten who he is, and even worse, who God is. He has an identity crisis of note. There is a truth that runs through the entire thread of Scripture. Right from the beginning in Genesis, where God says, I'm making man in my image, all the way through to Revelation, where in the very presence of God, we cast our crowns down before his throne and worship him. And the truth is this, that we are reflectors of what we worship. And so what we call worship, worshiping God faithfully, truly, is core to our identity. It's core to who we are. And if we worship anything other than our creator, then it's not really worship. There's another name for it. It's called idolatry. That's why the first commandment is, you shall have no other gods before me. God doesn't give that up. To us as the first commandment because he's a selfish power hungry God he gives that to us as our creator because he knows that's the only way we can be secure and happy and fulfilled is if we worship him because nothing that God has created can bear the weight of our worship not your children not your parents not your job not your bank balance not your house nothing that God has created can bear the weight of our worship, only our Creator. If we worship and put our weight on anything else, it will eventually give way, shatter in our hands or implode under our feet. God is the only thing that can bear the weight of our worship. So, in finding our identity, we have the option of defining ourselves vertically as children of God. And if we don't take that option, the only alternative is to define ourselves horizontally by the things and the people around us. Now, there's a lot of stuff around us, but we can summarize them into three categories. First of all, there's the performance, what we do, our achievements, all the accolades on our CV, our position at work, our position in the church, our position in the community. Then there's our possessions, what we have, our house, what's parked in the garage, our bank balance. And then the third one is people. We can also use people to find our identity. We can use what others think of us and say about us and how much others appreciate us or depend on us to define ourselves. And this one is especially challenging because 
God created us to be relational creatures. And so we do need each other. As Paul David Tripp says, when you look to another person as the primary source for your identity, you're not loving them. You're using them to love yourself. Now, none of these things, performance, possessions, people, are bad in and of, in and of themselves. God wants us to work hard and achieve success. And the Bible is full of stories of God blessing people with abundant possessions. And as we've just said, at our core, we are relational people. So people must be important to us. But it's when we rely on these things for our identity that we're in trouble because we misplace our worship and therefore misplace our identity. And misplaced identity first leads to either delusion or disappointment, and then ultimately to emptiness. This is because if you're doing well, and you have a lot of nice things, you've got good standing in the community, you get validation from all your relationships, you can delude yourself that that's enough, and that it'll last forever, and that's all you need. On the flip side of delusion is disappointment. Maybe things aren't going so well. You haven't achieved much, or your achievements have been hollow. You haven't got enough possessions. You worried about making it to the end of the month. Maybe your closest relationships are broken. And rather than giving you a secure sense of identity, they strike at the very core and make you question who you are. Am I really a good husband, a good wife, a good father, a good mother, a good elder? And leaving you disappointed and possibly angry with God. Either way, either delusion first or disappointment, you ultimately get to emptiness if you misplace your identity. Personally, I've lived long enough to have been both deluded and disappointed at various stages of my life. And maybe you can relate. Maybe when you were at school, you were at the top of your class, and then you hit varsity or the workplace, and you suddenly realized you're way more middle of the pack. Maybe when your kids were small, you were just the bee's knees. You were everything to them. And then they hit the teen years, and suddenly you're such an idiot. Maybe you had a stellar career, but now you've just retired. And all the meaning and purpose that you had has disappeared. And you're struggling to know who you are. Maybe you were blessed with great looks. And that's always been your mainstay. But as the years take their toll, that's being attacked. Unless we place our identity and our worship in our creator, nothing else bears the weight. So how does God deal with us? How does God deal with people like us who so easily define ourselves horizontally? Let's get back to our story and see what happens. God reassures Gideon, I will be with you. And you will destroy the Midianites as if you are fighting against one man. Gideon replies, if you are truly going to help me, Show me a sign to prove that it really is the Lord speaking to me. Don't go away until I come back and bring my offering to you. God answers and says, I will stay here until you return. And those of you who know the story know that this wasn't um, a light undertaking. Gideon goes away. He slaughters a goat. He bakes bread. I mean, this is probably three to five hours of preparation. And God waits patiently for him, sitting under the oak tree at Mamre. God is so patient with us. He will wait for as long as it takes, for as long as we need on our journey to find our identity in him. But as we'll see from the story as well, there are some steps that he sometimes needs us to take. That very night, after God does prove to Gideon, by consuming the sacrifice, the meal, 
that Gideon gives to him, that he is God and that he will be with him. God calls Gideon to some practical action. He says to him, pull down your father's altar to Baal and cut down the Asherah pole standing beside it. You see, sometimes in our journey to find our true identity, there's things about our old identity that need to be cut down, that need to be pulled down before God can build us up into the identity he has for us. If we need other people's approval to feel validated, if we find criticism or rejection debilitating, if we see a pattern of regularly disobeying God because we're trying to escape from or demand attention, or if we are caught in habitual and addictive sins through which we seek relief from our fears, then we have an idol problem. We have a false God that needs to be knocked down, a sin weight that needs to be cast aside. So God says to him, pull down that altar and build me a new altar. Lay the stones carefully. Focus on this task. And so Gideon takes 10 of his servants and does as, as God commands him. But, and I love this. I love God's word because it's not a story of perfect people performing flawlessly. The minute that God calls them to do something, they do it. Because how encouraging would that be to me? How encouraging would that be to you? In so many of the stories in the Bible, there's a but. And the but in Gideon's story is that he's scared. His identity is still very much defined in what other people think of him. He does it at night because he's afraid of the other members of his father's household and the people in the town. Now we get to the part of the story where, we, where our trailer left us. Gideon, after putting God through a few more tests just to make sure that God has been the one speaking to him, calls to arms, sends messages to the surrounding tri tribes and says, now is the time God is going to free us from the tyranny of the Midianites and the Amalekites and the other tribes. 32,000 soldiers gather at the spring of Herod. But God has other plans for them. The armies are camped not far away in the valley near the hill of Morah. And the Lord says to Gideon, you have too many warriors. <laughs> Gideon is like, okay, I've done the maths. I have 32,000, there's 135,000. That's a one to five ratio. Now, I know you're with us, but, and that might just be doable. But if you reduce my army, what are the chances? But God says to Gideon, if I let you fight with all these soldiers against the Midianites, the Israelites who are still so wrapped up in their identity of the, of the horizontal, of their own strength, they'll say this, that you saved yourselves in your own strength. Therefore, tell the people, whoever is timid or afraid may go home and leave this mountain. 22,000 soldiers pack their bags and head off, leaving only 10,000 who are willing to fight. And Gideon is like, okay, it's 1 to 13 now, might still pull this off. God says to him again, there are still too many. Bring them down to the spring and I will test them to determine who will go with you and who will not. And we know the story. If you're probably familiar with it. When I was a kid playing hide and seek or any game that required choosing teams, I would often want to do it near a body of water because this was a great way to test who the guys would be that would help me to win. The soldiers that forget their responsibility to be alert and look, after, look out for the enemy, just lean down on all fours, stick their heads in the spring and drink. Those who are still alert, lap, bring the water up to their mouths and lap it like a dog. And God says, these men, this tiny percentage 
of the 10,000 that are left are the ones that I will use to give you victory over the Midianites. And Gideon watches as 9,700 men head off over the horizon. Gideon finally accepts his identity in God as a mighty hero. They win, the, they win the battle. And after an incredible, miraculous rout of this army, 135,000 strong, the Israelites come to Gideon and say, be our ruler. You and your son and your grandson will be our rulers. You have rescued us from Midian. But Gideon knows that they don't get the nuance. And he says to them, I will not rule over you, nor will my son. The Lord will rule over you. Unless we find our identity in God as the one who leads us, in God as the one who gives us strength and power, we lost. So I'm not going to rule over you. I might be a leader and listen to God, but God will be the one that rules over you. And so, my prayer for you, as you go into 2023, and plan your activity, is that you will first find your identity, your true identity. The evidence is per persuasive, and the conclusion is clear. We tend to let the physical things of this world define us instead of Christ. But God doesn't give up on us in the midst of our stumbling. He'll continue to chase us down, sometimes taking away our possessions, our ability to perform, or even sometimes the people we are tempted to look for to find our identity, if necessary, so that we will worship him alone. Just as God stripped Gideon of his, almost his entire army, God brings us to the place where our hearts are ready to worship him alone. And a heart that worships God alone is a heart that finds rest, security, peace, and joy, regardless of the circumstances. God made us who we are so we could make known who he is. Our identity is for the sake of making known his identity. Where does your identity come from? That's the crucial question. And how you answer it will decide the trajectory and the course of 2023 for you. And it's not primarily, it's not primarily an intellectual answer because there's things that we all know that we can know the right answer but not know the right answer. So when you answer this question, you need to answer it from your heart because your heart is tied into what you really love, what you really want, what we really believe offers us hope. And what feeds hope is good news. And the good news is that God wants to be in a relationship with you way more than you want to be in a relationship with him. It was because of his great love and his desire to be reconciled with us that he sent his one and only son into the world 2,000 years ago. And he has an invitation for each of you to go on an identity-discovering adventure with him. The invitation is in God's word from the beginning to the end, running all the way through. It's in the form of a love letter from a father to his child. And I'd like to summarize and share it with you in closing. My child, you may not know me, but I know everything about you. I knew you before you were even conceived. You were made in my image. In me, you live and move and have your being. It is my desire to lavish my love on you simply because I am your father and you are my child. I am your provider and I meet all your needs. 
I desire to establish you with all my heart and all my soul. My plan for your future has always been filled with hope. When you seek me with all your heart, you will find me. Delight in me and I will give you all the desires of your heart, for it is I who gave you those desires in the first place. I am your greatest encourager. I am also the Father who comforts you in all your troubles. When you're brokenhearted, I'm close to you. One day, I will wipe away every tear from your eyes. I am your Father, and I love you even as I love my Son, Jesus. For in Jesus, my love for you is revealed. He is the exact representation of my being. He came to demonstrate that I am for you, not against you. And I gave up everything that I loved that I might gain your love. If you receive the gift of my son Jesus, you receive me. And nothing will ever separate you from my love again. Come home and I'll throw the biggest party heaven has ever seen. I've always been father and I always will be father. My question is, will you be my child? Love your dad, almighty God. Amen. the wonder of sunset at evening, the wonder of sunsets I see, but the wonder of wonders that thrills my soul is the wonder that God loves me. of it all, the wonder of it all, just to think that God loves me, oh, the wonder of it all, the wonder of it all, just to think that God loves me. There's the wonder of springtime and harvest, the sky, the stars, the sun. But the wonder of wonders that thrills my soul is the wonder that's all he begun. Oh, the wonder of it all, the wonder of it all, just to think that God loves me. Oh, the wonder of it all, the wonder of it all, just to think that God loves me. Father in heaven, it is a wonder that you love us, but we are so forgetful amnesiacs living in a world hell-bent on destroying our identity in you. 
We are your children. And as we journey into 2023 with you, keep us close in your everlasting love, in the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ, and in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, now, through 2023, and into eternity. Amen. Thank you, James, for that wonderful